Hello everybody, welcome live. You are the first person watching my new TV show. So, exciting. We're gonna be talking about book of the day. So the whole idea of this TV show, try to do it every day. Most of them will be live. Every once in a while, if I'm traveling, they'll be recorded. But, we're gonna talk about things that change your life, revolutionize your life. The best way to do that, no matter what anybody tells you, is increase the amount of knowledge in your brain. Quickest way to do that, download the expertise of the smartest people in the world. So my job is to try to find the best books, the best, best authors, the best sources of information, and try to bring it to you in a source that's not going to take you all day to download, right? If you read this book, we're talking about Where Good Ideas Come From by Steven Johnson. That's today's book of the day. This is a New York Times bestselling author. He wrote The Natural History of Innovation. Um, you know, this book, let me just set the stage why I picked this book for you. Right now, in the world we live in, there may be no better skill that you can possess than the ability to come up with good ideas. Just think about it. If you don't believe me, what's the reward for good ideas? Well, ask Mark Zuckerberg, 30, uh, $27 billion later, ask him what the reward was. And if you think about Facebook, it wasn't that big of an idea uh, because MySpace and Friendster had already set the stage five, six years before. Really, if you think about what Zuckerberg did at the beginning, obviously there's been many other ideas. What Facebook did was had one good idea. What if we can privatize the experience? If you remember MySpace, man, you could get friend requests from strangers and girls would get creeped out because weird guys were writing them and friend requesting them. And Facebook basically had one good idea, which was if you make it so you can only message people who both parties have agreed to be friends with, uh, with each other. Then you create a brand new experience. That one good idea made Zark Mark Zuckerberg, if you do the time value of money, maybe the wealthiest person in the world right now. Obviously, he has less money than Bill Gates, but he's younger. So if you adjust it. So the value of a good idea to you for you might not be a billion dollars per se, that, right? But you don't need a billion dollars. Uh, you know, I was just reading this article by Daniel Kahneman. I was rereading the research. I talk about it. Um, and I'm going to actually, this TV show, after this show, if you want, you'll be able to register. I'm doing right after this, five minutes after this show's over. This is a 30-minute show. Right after this, I'm doing an on, uh, online seminar right here on my site. And I'm going to be talking about, uh, you know, how to get a million people to pay attention to your good idea. The new rules of marketing. So that's more of a business talk. Before I get to that, this TV show, and, and that show you have to register, the uh, online seminar you have to register for. This show you're watching now is just public. Um, so, you know, I was researching for the business seminar how much money you really need to be happy. And you don't have to be Mark Zuckerberg. Time Magazine had a good headline. $75,000 a year buys you happiness. Money can buy you happiness uh, at a certain level, according to Nobel Prize winning research from Princeton University. So good ideas have the potential to change your bank account. Good ideas have the potential to change your body. Obviously, you know, it's interesting. My dad was born in, I forget what year, I should know this, but a long time ago, a while ago, he had me when he was a lot older. And he was born with scarlet fever, so he had heart problems. And the doctor said to my grandparents, he's not going to live past uh, age, I think they said 12. So my dad was this sickly kid, and here's my green drink. Everybody always asks what's in it. Something horrible like spinach. and ugh. Anyway, uh, so my dad's nursed, sheltered, because everybody says, oh, don't, you know, the doctor said, don't make his heart beat real fast because he has a weak heart from scarlet fever and he'll die, so don't let him exercise, don't let him play with all the other kids. So my dad gets to 12, he's still alive, this is in Harlem, my dad's from Harlem, New York, and uh, completely sickly. And then 
I don't know what the, the trigger was. Well, actually, my dad told me. I'm not that close with my real dad, but he said he read something somewhere, a magazine article about weightlifting, and he picked up some weights. Now, remember, this is back in the 1940s, and we're going to be talking about what this book talks about, the 10-10 rule of innovation, and you'll see it. It happened for my dad, and there's examples in this book. You, you got to read this book, by the way. This is a mind-blowing book that I just happened to bump up into on a, tri on a trip the other day in the airport. So my dad's, you know, 10 or uh, 14. He reads this article. He's completely weak, and all of a sudden, those weights, that idea that was passed on to him through a ma this magazine takes my dad from this sick kid to several years later, my dad was Mr. Junior USA. He went on to become Mr. Canada, uh, Mr. New York, Mr. Puerto Rico. He had the world record bench press and he became a lifelong enthusiast and weight and professional bodybuilder. And so it's if you look at the seed of all that, and the seed of every great thing that could happen to your life. Just pick something you don't like in your life today. It could be how much money you have. It's usually around what I call the big four, or four pillars of life, health, wealth, love, or happiness. You either don't like your body. Sometimes that's a delusional. Maybe you, know, you have body image issues. But most people that don't like their body, it's because there's probably not at optimal health. So maybe you don't feel good. Maybe. And... I think somewhere around uh, when it comes to career, I read only 12% of humans on the planet now. I mean, uh, people spend on average only 12% of their day in a career doing something that they actually have passion about. So maybe it's about money and your career. You hate your job or something. Maybe it's love life. Man, you know, there's never been a time in history where we're doing more quote unquote experiments with love and friendships. You know, I was just visiting the Amish 10 days ago when I was, uh, for Thanksgiving, where I used to live when I was a younger kid for a couple of years. And they have intricate social webs. The good idea that the Amish had is not really an Amish idea. It's the way the whole world lived 300 years ago. You lived in smaller communities with people in a one-room classroom. You grew up with them. You knew them from a young child. You had strong bonds. Uh, Jonathan Haidt calls this companionative love. Our brain is built to have companionative love, which means you need someone that you've known for like a decade or 20 or 30 years. But you and I are trapped in a world where you're, or I shouldn't say trapped, but it feels sometimes trapped where you're moving around all the time. So, and then of course, happiness. A lot of people, what is it, 30%? One out of three people are on some medication to make them feel better. So, in a world of mass confusion, you, if you're not careful, will lose your way. If you're on my Twitter, I just posted this today. You know, it's easy to lose your way in the mono world. I've done it. I'm sure you've done it. And millions of people are in the midst of it right now. And the way out is always with ideas. This is what makes you and I different than animals. There is no other species that has the ability to come up with ideas, both for good and for bad, unfortunately, uh, than humans. Nothing. Most animals, I had a, uh, speaking of ideas, a couple years ago I had dinner with, at a house, uh, my grandma set up. My grandma's a professor, or was a professor, so she has all these Nobel Prize winning old friends that are like 90 years old. So I went to dinner with one of the top living philosophers. He's 90 some years old. And uh, he knew I had been on a farm at the Amish and Joel Salatin and all this. And the guy said to me, he said, hey, Ty, you know, do you think animals have consciousness like human? Now, this is the maybe the number one living philosopher asking me a question. I was blown away, very humble guy, which is another lesson in and of itself. But I said, I think they do more than we think. And I asked him his opinion, and he said, I don't think they do. I think animals can't come up with an idea about what's going to happen two weeks from now. Um, I, I tend to disagree a bit, but I, in the big picture, he's definitely right. Animals, may, even the smartest dog, there was a border collie named Winston Cap. It's the smartest border collie or the most famous dog, herding dog. 
most of the dogs alive are related to him because everybody wanted their dogs to have puppies with this one dog from uh, Wales in England. And even that, do that dog had the IQ, they say, of about a six-year-old. But even at six years old, you and I can't come up with ideas necessarily to project very far in the future. So here's where we're at. You have to know where good ideas come from for yourself. Now, I'm not in this time, just so you know, there's not everything that I can cover in this book. Obviously, it's a 300, what is it, 300 page book. But in the next few minutes, we're going to go over what I consider some of the key takeaways so that throughout your day today, and you can come back tomorrow and the next day on these, uh, TV sh this TV show that I'm putting out, uh, to start your day with some good ideas. So let's get good ideas, a few that I've picked. So the first one that I find fascinating is something called negative quarter power scaling. Negative quarter power scaling. What that means, and I'm going to quote, scientists and animal lovers have long observed that as life gets bigger, it slows down. Flies live for just a few minutes or hours. Elephants live for 50 to 100 years. Parrots, tortoises. Now, what's the difference? The hearts of bird and small mammals pump blood much faster than those of giraffes and blue whales. But the relationship between size and speed doesn't seem to be a linear one, meaning a rabbit that's half the size of something of, let's say, I don't know, a f dog, uh, the dog doesn't necessarily age twice as fast, uh, twice as slowly uh, as the rabbit. So they came up uh, in University of Davis, a guy named Kleiber discovered a scaling phenomenon called negative quarter power scaling. So it's a logarithmic grid, okay? Now, what does that matter? It says the math is simple enough. You take the square root of 1,000, which is approximately 31, then take the square root of 31, which is approximately 5.5. That's your number right there. You now know something very few people know in the world. 5.5. That means a cow, which is roughly 1,000 times heavier than a woodchuck, chuck will on average live 5.5 times longer and have a 5.5 times slower heartbeat. Now, you might wonder, what's the relevance? Well, the relevance is when we're talking about the spreading of ideas, the spreading of wealth, money, the spreading of disease, Ebola, all these diseases that you may be worried about, the flu, whatever it might be, the spreading of friendships. How about the spreading of gossip? Some of these things that could have a direct impact on your life. So over the decades, Kleiber's law was extended down to bacteria, cell, metabol uh, cell metabolism. Then a physicist named Geoffrey West decided to investigate whether this applies to cities, the largest, the superorganism they call it, of modern humans. And sure enough, they were delighted that Kleiber's negative power scaling governed the energy and transportation growth of cities. The number of gas stations, gasoline sales, road service area, the length of electric cables. Okay? Now, it's very interesting though. So, a city is a scaled up village where things happen at this 5.5 rate. But, one place this negative quarter scaling 5.5 law did not work. Okay? Every data point that involved creativity and innovation, patents, super creative professionals, inventors, they followed a quarter power law, but there was one fundamental difference. That law was positive. What that means? A city that was 10 times larger than its neighbor wasn't 10 times more innovative. It was 17 times more innovative. A metropolis 50 times bigger than a smaller town was 130 times more innovative. This is called super linear scaling. Now, uh, 
there's a saying, great cities are not like towns, only larger. Uh, that's what Jane Jacobs wrote. Here, here's the thing for you to understand. The pace of innovation and good ideas that are going to come out of your brain are di directly related uh, to the size of the pool of information you're drawing from. Now, some people ask, you know, Ty, why'd you do your TED th Talk thingy on books? If you look at my YouTube channel, a lot of people argue with me and say, Ty, books is not where you get knowledge. You get knowledge by your own experience, but they don't understand something you now understand. Proven over and over in laboratories. Negative quarter scaling when it comes to creativity is positive, meaning the larger sample that you're getting your information from, now to a point, okay, assuming your sources are good, you're gonna get an exponential growth in the amount of good ideas in your head that, that are gonna affect your health, wealth, love, and happiness. So what I mean is, if your only source of good ideas is one book, maybe you read one book in the last six months, you know, not fiction, not Twilight or something. So you're like a small town. Your pool of available knowledge where you're going to draw your next big thing from, it's too small. See, if you read 10 books according to this, instead of one, you don't get 10 times smarter. It's exponential. In this case, what did he say exactly? Uh, what was the number here? I lost it. Uh, yes. So a city 50 times bigger. So if the average person, let's say read, let's say they read, uh, I don't know, one book, one book a year on how to improve their life. Okay. Let's say you read 50 times, 50 books, just 50 books. That's one a week. By the way, that's the average uh, CEO's reading rate, about 50 books a year. That means you are going to be not 50 times more knowledgeable. You will be 130 times more knowledgeable. By reading 50 books instead of one, you'll be 130 times. Why? Now, the reason that happens is relative common sense. If you're just talking to one person, it's a one-way street. You give them an idea, they give you an idea. Creatively, you bounce back and forth. If there's three people in the group now, it's not just three times more bouncing back because you bounce back with Bob, you bounce back with Susie, you back, bounce back ideas with Jenny. That's three. But now Jenny bounces back with you into her brain with Susie and with Bob. That's six. And then Bob can bounce with Susie and he's getting ideas. So it's way more than three times. That's why if you study, let's say the famous sociologist Robin Dunbar, who came up with this number called Dunbar's number, which says you should have, or our brain is best acclimated to having about 150 friends, acquaintances, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's not because we can only handle 150 acquaintances, you might have way more than that on your Facebook. No, it's because you have to keep track of each of their friendships. So 150 acquaintances and friends is actually 10,000 connections. So the takeaway uh, from this, the first one, is that you must become what Joel Salatin and Alan Nation, my mentors, told me. You have to become more eclectic. And I have one rule. Eclectic, by the way, means you draw from larger uh, pools of information. So let's say you are a doctor and you want to get better at your profession. Don't just read books by other doctors. Open up the sample set larger. Read a book on business. Read a book on marketing. Read a book on dating and social relationships. Read a book on human happiness. Read a book on art and history. As you expand the pool, you will get this negative quarter scaling, 5.5 exponential rate of knowledge. The caveat is if you expand to poor, poise, uh, poor sources of knowledge, which many people do, they just ask their best friend, oh, what do you think about 
investing in the stock market. Well, if your friend doesn't know anything, then you the negative quarter scaling rule is actually going to be your enemy. It is going to sabotage your efforts and you're gonna actually now Negative quarter scaling works against you. The rate of bad information flying into your brain will get worse, uh, will get larger and larger, and your results, the ideas that you come up, you won't come up with the next Facebook idea. You'll come up with some stupid idea that never gets any traction, or worse, ends up harming you and everybody that it bumps into your idea. It's an interesting world we live in, seven billion people. now. I don't quite have time. I want to talk about this 10-10 rule. I'm going to touch on this, but um, I want to, one thing, I'm starting to do these book of the day deals. So this is today's book deal. So this is my book of the day summary you're watching right now on this TV show. But I'm also offering that you can buy the book of the day. This is the deal you're going to get right now. There should be a button right below uh, the TV little screen player here. Click it. And you can buy this book directly from me. I don't really make any much money on the books. So I'm, you can basically get it for about the same price as you're going to get bar, bookstores, Amazon, wherever. But one thing better if you buy from me. I'm going to include my notes on this book. A record, that's one. A recording, of the, a replay recording of this in case you didn't see the whole thing. And a whole bunch of bonuses. I'm excited. I just recorded seven step, my seven video series. Now, I normally charge for this. It's about 100 bucks, but I'm going to throw it in now. If you buy the book of the deal, they deal this book. It'll be shipped. We're, we've gotten good at shipping. We'll have this thing shipped, uh, shipping process. We do it today. You order it today. We're trying to get it within 10 minutes to get your book shipped. Uh, in process, depending on where you live in the world, it might take a little few days to get to you, but we've got this down efficiently, very efficiently now. So you're gonna get this book as fast as if you ordered it on Amazon, number one, but instead of just getting the book, you're gonna get all this other stuff free. That's my free bonuses if you get it now. So click the button below, get this book. It's one of the great books that I've read. I wish I had more time, we're only on page 10. Imagine now if this whole book was downloaded into your brain, or at least as you're gonna learn in the free bonuses that you're gonna get when you buy this, you're gonna learn the smart reading techniques. I laid out seven steps, I've never done this before. Laid out the seven steps on how I read a book a day. It's about technique, it's about philosophy, it's about routines, it's about the type of books to read, the type of books to avoid, it's about when to read, how to posture to read, where you should be laying down, what kind of bookmarks to use, how to mark up, take notes. Everything is there, okay? So click that. We're going to have that button up here for you to buy for a few minutes. And then we're going to take it down because I have one other thing for you. So I'm going to get to this. I got a few more minutes. We got five more minutes here. Try, trying to run this like a TV show, so they're going to yank me. Uh, the 10 10 rule. This is fascinating. And I'm going to be talking about this more. When this show is over, I have one more show that I do. Uh, except it's not a TV show, it's an online seminar. So in a few minutes, uh, it, it's free. When this TV show is over, it would take about five minute break so I can drink some more of my green drink. And we'll move the cameras to the seminar room and we'll be doing a seminar uh, on, and this is gonna be interesting related to this book. This is for you if you've ever thought of starting your own business want to make more money, you got to get to that 75,000 financial independence level. Uh, or if you're already an entrepreneur and you want to scale that business up, you can use the, the quarter law of scaling. So <clears throat> if you're watching a recording, depending, I'm not sure where you are, but there should be a button here on the video that you can register completely free uh, for the free online seminar, the new rules of marketing, how to get a million eyeballs to look at your new idea. You have something you wanna sell, you have a new idea, you want investors, we're gonna be talking about that in just a few minutes right after this. So click to watch that uh, seminar. But I wanna get back to this. And that's free, but you have to, you gotta register for that. It's different than this TV show. All right, 10-10 rule. Call it the 10-10 rule. It takes a decade to build a new idea and a decade for mass adoption. 
Now this goes along. Some of you might watching this might be in some of my business training stuff, the investor entrepreneur, mini MBA or the inner circle. I just did a talk on the book. I'm not sure where it is behind me, but it's called, uh, it's a famous one. It's by uh, Moore, I think is his name, Joffrey Moore. It's called Crossing the Chasm. And it talks about why you may have had an idea tried to launch it, but you couldn't get it over the chasm. It was a great idea, and that's because there's four main types of psychological consumers in the world. You have early visionaries and early adopters. So when you have a good idea and you go launch and you go sell your new sushi restaurant or you come up with a health supplement or a new patent copyrighted idea and you get out there, your friends and family love it. Those are the visionaries and early adopters. But there's a huge chasm that you must cross to get to the pragmatists, the conservative buyers, and the bad news is most of your buyers are there, but they only buy when three other people of their friends have purchased. They're practical. But how, if nobody's buying, how do you get critical mass so that everybody has three friends? Well, people like Steve Jobs with his iPhone has been able to cross the chasm. Now, I don't have time. I'll, I'll touch on that in, a se in the next uh, seminar if you stay on for that. Make sure you register below here, by the way, for that. But the 1010 rule says it's a decade to build a new platform. So look at grass-fed food like Joel Salatin came up with or Alan Nation. If you've read the book Omnivore's Dilemma, now everybody's talking about pastured chickens and organic vegetables and all this. But if you go back in the 50s, 40s, 60s, 70s, guys like Rodale, Joel Salatin, Alan Nation, they were pushing this idea, but yet they needed time to come up with how to do it. I was just on Joel Salatin's farm. It's not easy to raise animals without, uh, and food without herbicides, insecticides, chemical fertilizers, and so on. So I don't have time to go completely into this, but understand there's a natural curve to ideas. So if you're adopting a new idea, that's why I say sometimes the best way is to start by adopting someone else's idea that they've spent the 10 years innovating and you just build on top of it. That's what Mark Zuckerberg did with Facebook took them about eight, nine, ten years uh, for that industry. It started back in the late 90s with chat rooms, social networks, Friendster, MySpace. Then Facebook grabbed hold of that 10 year and built on top of it. And then it took a little less than 10 years for Facebook, but that gives you an idea. So if you have an idea, don't be totally discouraged. Be patient. So remember, uh, if you're watching this, depending on where you're watching it, and there's comments below, I want you to leave me two quick comments to end this because it's not enough to just listen. You got to make this stuff instinctual like the Dalai Lama says in Beyond Religion. It's more than just book smarts. Number one, how can you increase the pool of knowledge so that you can take advantage of negative core, uh, of this scaling rule, 5.5? How can you get more good sources of information? Where can you go? I, I suggest books good YouTube videos, seminars, conferences. I didn't get time to talk about this, but masterminds. That's why I have my inner circle mastermind. Secondly, when have you been impatient and didn't understand the 10-10 rule and should have let some more time go so that your idea could catch hold? All right, two things. Buy this book. You should find a link below here and register for the seminar. I'll be doing it in five minutes. We're talking about how to get a million people to pay attention to your new business idea the new rules of marketing. So Ty signing off tomorrow, same time, next book of the day. I've got an exciting one. So stay tuned. Talk to you soon.